This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Why do people react so vociferously to what you say? That was a question to former professional basketball player Charles Barkley, who I think is generally on the money with his comments. Barkley responded, because I think people want their subject to be right no matter what. People like for Charles to be honest unless he says something different from them. That's all it is. I'm pretty sure you get criticism. The reporter responded, all the time. Charles responded, people like you as long as you agree with them, but that doesn't really bother me. Now, he's a wise guy who's been in the public eye for a long time. I've been in a little bit of public eye, just a little bit, but long enough to appreciate deep in my gut what he's talking about. Criticism to me in 2015, if I don't have criticism, if I don't cause some people to get itchy, if I don't cause some people to get sweaty, if I don't cause some people to scream, if I don't have haters, if I don't have something, I'm not saying anything. And that applies to you too. If somebody, if nobody, if there's not anybody that really detests the angle that you take on life, the angle that you take on your work. If everyone's happy with you, pray tell, what are you doing? What kind of a dent are you making? You have got to go out there and take the shots. Take the shots. Put people in their place. No, I'm not trying to be a mean or a negative guy. I'm just saying so many people go through life and they don't stand up. They don't offer an opinion. I'm not saying just to randomly go out there and blow hard. Do your homework. Get the facts. Get out there in the game. I don't care what your subject is. I don't care what your endeavor is, what kind of entrepreneur you are. Take a shot. It's a hell of a lot more fun than sitting on the sideline. Just kind of an opening comment. My guest today is Mike Shell, Shell Capital Management. Mike appeared on the podcast early on. I was most grateful for that. His appearance, many other appearances by very notable people really helped to establish my podcast. I hope you enjoy this second conversation with Mike Shell. I'm down in uh, Tampa, Florida. I have our house here for the winter time, so we're spending the, these cold months in uh, Tampa, St. Pete, where it uh, feels like spring outside so far. So, now let me ask you: is that is that a result? I know you at one point in time, back in a, a blue moon ago, you worked for Raymond James. I remember as a young guy going to interview with a guy at Raymond James main office there in St. Pete. And I don't know if they still have these, but they used to have these hot dog stands where these beautiful girls would stand outside on these really immaculate streets in St. Pete and sell hot dogs. Is that still a, a, a part of St. Pete? They, they call that food trucks. And uh, now they do not just hot dogs. They do a little bit of everything. I mean, you can get a, probably get a filet on a food truck. And they're, they're in lots of different areas. I have to say, it wasn't as much the hot dogs as I was remembering. I just remember it was a very... Very attractive hot dog servers in St. Pete. So uh, that was my, <laughs> my memory from many, many years ago. Hey, let me jump right into the serious stuff. I thought because there's some interesting ways that we can break things apart. And I love, it's not necessarily a unique thought, but I thought we could start there, which is the idea that everything that you do in your trading world, you're deciding in advance what price you will sell at if you're wrong. And I still think to this day, as many times, as many conversations that you have had, as many that I've had, the notion that you will 
know in advance, decide in advance the price you'll sell at if you're wrong, it's still tricky for most people to accept because they always want to say, well, what's the definition of wrong? Exactly. That's an excellent way to start. If I've got something that I want to get into at 50 because some s signal said that I should because the trend's going up, for example, then, then I have to know at 45 or whatever, you know, what, what point am I going to get out? And I'm just using 45 as an example. So if I'm going to get in at 50, I want to predefine my risk before I ever buy at 50. I already going to know in advance at what point am I going to get out of that position and say I'm wrong. And I tell you, Mike, the thing is, is that when that occurs, you have to, I, I, I truly accept the loss as it is. So if I buy at 50 and I just, and my, my algorithms determine that I'm going to get out at 45, then, then that $5 is all I'm risking in that position. Everybody else may be risking 50 because they may hold it until it goes to zero. Okay. Like, you know, like some stocks in the past. But the thing is, when I buy at 50, I'm going to get out at a certain point. And, and when I determine what that point is, I do not put a stop loss in because I'm usually trading directly with market makers and things. But I, I'm, I'm ultimately looking at this stuff every morning about 6 a.m. until about 11 a.m. And I determine when it gets down to that certain price, I'm going to get out. And, and the key is, the human element is, is that you have to be so accepting of what your risk is that you got in at 50, I'm going to get out at 45, and, and as far as my, I go in my mind, I have already lost that money. I, that position has already gone to 45. That is how, that is the level in which uh, I have accepted the risk that I'm taking in that position. Mike, let me interject here. How do you know that you're wrong? How, why, why could you just be buying something that's now undervalued? You've got a, you've got a value play here. Why are you wrong by going from 50 to 45? Exactly. When, when, so using the $50 example, so if I'm getting into something at 50, I have methods that I, you know, really it's, a, it's mathematical equations more than anything. And of course, I could also do this using charts. You know, 30 years ago, they were just using charts. They didn't have programs. You know, we talk about the turtles, you know, a lot. Well, the fact is the turtles had chart books. Okay. So they, they had ways that it had been tested, but they ultimately look at price charts and they actually had to manually do a lot of things. And today we have programs that can do a lot of they could systematize a lot of those things for us. But when I get in at 50 and I determine what my exit point is, and it could be, it could be 40, it could be 45, it may be 40, 47. The way that I determine that myself is there's, there's really two functions to it. Number one is if I am entering a trend that is going up, okay, if I'm buying something because it's going up, and, and that 50 is the is the price point in which I'm going to get in and I define that it is going up. And then there again, there's another an, another equation, a mathematical equation. Then, then at what point, if I get in at 50, at what point am I wrong would be at what point is it no longer going up? So, so you, so you could visualize conceptually if, if I'm in, if I'm getting in at 50, you could look at a price chart, for example, and say, okay, well, what, at what point would that no longer be rising? At what point is it now going down and, and going the other way than what I hoped it would continue? And so that, that could be as simple as, you know, looking at a price chart and saying, okay, when it goes below its prior low, then now we're going to call it a downtrend and we're going to get out there. So, so a chartist would look at it that way. And that's how they would define it. Another real key part, though, is that so you have to define your what you have to define what a trend is. Okay, first of all, what is a positive trend, and then at, once you once you define it as a positive trend, then what is a negative trend? And that is the whole really cool thing about systems is that when you develop a complete system, then you have you have answers. You're forced to answer every single question involved in all of this process. And so I, you know, I have been, you know, over the past 15 years, been forced to answer every single question that can possibly come up. And it's all about the price and the direction of the trend. It's all about the volatility. It has nothing to do with what's going on in the economy or Greece or some other country or what, what the election is going to do. It, it's all about what the, tr what the actual price, the absolute trend is doing. And so when that trend begins to, to go down, by my definition of down, so it's going up because because I think it's going up because I define it as going up and I have an equation for which I do that. When it starts going down, then I define what down is. And if it goes, say, from 50 to 45, and I say at 45, it is no longer 
going in the direction that I want it to go, and I'm going to get out. And that may be 40. It could be some other number. I'm just using those as very broad conceptual examples. Now, and now there's, there's a few more key pieces. So there's the direction of the trend itself. Is it no longer intact? If it's not, let's get out and let's go on to something else. And now, now, and by the way, if it goes down to 45 and it turns around and goes back up again, and, and next thing you know, two weeks later it's at 52, that doesn't mean I won't turn around and buy it again because you know now it's in an uptrend again. So I, you know that, that's called a whipsaw. It happens. It doesn't happen all that often in my systems, but it does happen. I'm very, uh, very willing to accept it. That's the human element, as I'm willing to accept it, and that's part of what I do, you know. But. But the it's really about is that trend no longer intact? Is it no longer trending by my definition? And then the second thing here's a key part. the The second thing is is there's a volatility element now, and and this is basic you know turtle uh, the turtle level stuff from from you know twenty thirty years ago. The second element is is that and here's how I describe it because I'm not I'm using my own methods. I come up with my own you know everything that I do is some proprietary methodology for which I have developed for myself, and it's a way it's a is as a. It's, it's systems that suit me personally, and as a human being, I'm able to do these things, so I define my own systems. Now, here's a key point, too. When I size that position and determine how much, okay, let's look at the difference in the sizing algorithm between 50 and 45 versus 50 and 40, okay? So let's say the way I determine how much, which is a whole other concept and a whole other algorithm, a whole other complete system, is... At if it, let's just assume, and, and, and what I'm, I'm going to use, a, I'm going to use a one percent example because that's a common example. And let's suppose I'm risking one percent of my equity every, in every position, and one and percent is a very conceptual thing here. I'm not saying I'm doing this, and my, my risk may be lower, it may be higher. It's probably more lower than it is higher. But let's assume, Mike, that I on a, on, a, on for every million dollars, I'm going to risk one percent of my total equity. Well, that means for every million dollars, I'm only going to risk $10,000. Well, the way I determine how much to buy is I take $10,000, I determine from that $10,000 at risk, how much am I risking in the position? So from 50 to 45 is $5 per share, right? So now let's do the equation in our head here. So $10,000 divided by 5 tells me to buy 2,000 shares of that position. 2,000 shares of a position that's $50 a share is, is $100,000. So the total position would be 10%, but my risk is only 1% of my total equity. So my, my, my total position would show up as in a 10% position, but the risk of my total equity is only 1% because I'm going to get out at 45. You see how that works? Now that is, you know, basic money management in my book. Now I'll tell you, as, as simple as that sounds to me, uh, the most basic concepts, uh, most people don't understand that. Let me jump to a slightly different subject as we just kind of, there's a few talking points I want to make sure that I get in here. So I've seen you make the comment, I want to risk $1 and make $2. And, you know, most people, even people that have heard something about the notion of trading trends and systematic strategies, the idea of I want to risk a dollar and make two. But if you're wrong half the time, you can still make 50 cents on average. Why do you explain that notion, Professor Shell? I think the audience will like hearing your explanation for that. Absolutely. Excellent question. So first of all, let's use let's use like a coin flip analogy. So you flip a coin and you got 50 odd, 50 percent odds. So when you flip a coin, the probability of flipping a fair coin is 50 percent. So 50 percent of the time it's going to land on heads, 50 percent of the time it's going to land on tails. Now, now, first of all, let me say this. If we only flip it 10 times, it may be seven and three. OK, so so the more times you flip the coin, the more closer you're going to get your probability. OK, now, so there's the probability part of the equation. Mathematical expectation is the probability, which is your win ratio versus your loss ratio. So your, your probability is your win ratio. The expectation part is your payoff. Now, in a coin flip, it's, if it's 50-50, which is, which is totally random, then, then what, what we need to understand is that think about what you can control. If you flip a coin, can you make that coin land on heads? Can you force that coin to land on heads? 
If you're going to flip a coin a hundred times, are you able to force that coin to land on heads more often than tails? We're not. We can't force the coin to land on heads more often than tails. We can't control the outcome of the probability. Okay? We can't make it do that. We can't really skew the probability in a coin flip. Okay? What we but so let's look at the other side of the equation. When it does land on heads and we win, okay, if if we when we win, can we control how much we make, how much we earn when we win. So if it lands on heads, can we make it go to a, can we make it $2? If we bet a dollar, can we make it $2? No, we cannot. We cannot physically force it to, uh, to, you know, we can't, in other words, when we buy into something at 50, we can't make it go uh, to 60. Okay. So taking this to the, the, the example I used earlier, the $50 position with a $45 uh, you know, dollar exit with a $5 risk, I can't make that thing go to 60. I don't care what I do, no matter how much research I do, I can't force that to happen. The one thing I can do, though, is when I buy at 50 and I get out at 45, I will lose $5. Now, that's going to sometimes end up being 10 or 8 and 7. Sometimes maybe I, you know, some people may get out too soon and they'll, they won't even let it go to 45 for some reason. They'll get out at 43. But overall, we can control our downside loss. That is the key. Is that, and especially say if we were to use options, imagine if you used a call option and you only pay $2 for the call and you have a delta of, of 0.5, so you really need four, you, need, you really need two call options. So you, so you see how you can control the downside. It's the, it's the essence of the downside risk management. Uh, it, that is the part of the equation that I believe we can control because we can predefine our risk. We predefine our risk and I can accept my risk. And once I've accepted my risk, then I just let it rip. That's why you hear me say so often that I predefine my risk, I decide what it is, and I let it rip and I let it go. And so that is the essence of portfolio management to me, is that I, I, the, the, the downside is actually the part that we can control the most because we can predefine our risk. And if we can predefine our risk and I can say, okay, so I'm going to bet, we're going to sit here together and we're going to flip this coin. And when, when it lands on tails, I get a dollar. And when it lands on heads, I get $2. If we can skew that payoff, then we have the probability of 50-50. And if we can skew that payoff, then, then we will ultimately have an expectation of 50 cents. Because 50% of the time, we're going to make $2, which nets out at a dollar. 50% of the time, we're going to lose a dollar, which nets out at, at 50 cents. A dollar minus 50 cents is 50 cents. So if we do that often enough, and that's the key, it's not the next 10 trades, it's the next 100 or the next 1,000. If we do that often enough, then ultimately we end up making that 50 cents on average on the trades and we're risking a dollar. And so that's how, the, you know, we have to think in terms of probability and payoffs. And that is what I call and trademarked the term asymmetry. To me, asymmetry is the skewing of these things. Now, where I would, well, I was, when I first started developing my, my systems and methods, that was the, that is the, the, the real essence and the cornerstone of everything that I, that I believed. I did not believe I could skew my payoff. I did not believe I could skew my probability, but I did feel pretty sure that if I put a good solid exit in, if I buy it at 50 and at $45, I know that that's outside the normal range of the market. And if it goes down to that point, it's probably, you know, probably not something I should be in. You know, you see how that works. So, so that, you know, in, in the coin flip analogy, that would be a dollar. So I'm risking a dollar every time I do it. And if on average I earn $2 when I win, then the payoff ultimately is a positive expectation. Now, the key is there's a lot of pieces to all that. There's a whole lot of pieces. Because when we, when we take that basic bare bones example right there and start analyzing it, what everybody wants to do is they want to try to increase their probability. They want to make their probability higher, so they think they can do more research and find the better trends, or they can, you know, find the next Apple or whatever it may be. They they want to do a lot of research and try to pay. You know, they want to focus on probability. They're trying to do something that they can't actually do. We cannot. We cannot. Nobody can know in advance what is going to be the winner. And I, I truly accept that as a human, and that's the human element, you see. Again, me and other people that I know that do this well, we accept that we cannot control which ones, which are going to be the winners and which are going to be the losers. And that's everybody else's problem, Mike. What's really amazing about the notion of that is the, the percent accuracy. There's this 
this thinking amongst many investors, many traders, some experienced, some new. If I can just get my accuracy to 60%, my accuracy to 70%, you know, their they're, they're winning percent up. And I, I sometimes just scratch my head and I'm like, have you bothered? I, I'm saying this rhetorically, but have you bothered? I, I want to say it to them. Have you bothered to look at the people that have done this for decades before you? And if they haven't figured out how to do it to get this high winning percentage and they don't need to do it to make a lot of money, then why the, why the blank are you pursuing it? Now, of course, one has to do the research and they have to make sure that they can justify and understand on their own. I mean, you know, trust me as far as you can throw me. But still, there's people that I think just continue to search for something they'll never find. Well, good point. There's two parts to that. Okay, so so part A is is that yes that that is the that is the most common human element issue is that the human being wants to be right and it goes back to school you know if you want to if you want to go to college you better get A's in, in high school if you want to go to graduate school you better you know do really well in undergraduate school if you want a PhD you're spending your entire life needing to get the A and, and to get the A's you just you have to memorize material and go regurgitate it onto a test. And and then the second thing is if you play sports, so if you're a hockey player you better you know you want to win the games. If you're a football player you want to win the games. So we are taught to win and we're taught to to score, you know, we're, we're, that's that's just that that is how we are that's how we're taught. Some of us are taught that way more than others, I think. Some of us we're probably raised in a way that that we that we were forced to do that more than others. I personally uh, did not grow up that way. I was allowed to be myself, and I think that uh, I went to college because I wanted to go to college, not because you know my parents made me, you know, and all those things. So I think there's a lot of there there are a lot of things about uh, all of us individually that that makes us all unique and allow and allows us to do these things. There's two parts to the probability. Everybody wants to be, you know, you see these high winning rate that when you see a these systems advertised uh, that they have a high winning ratio, you know, run for the hills because I'm telling you right now, it, it, you, you're, you're dealing with somebody who believes they know the future. You're dealing with somebody who believes they know what's going to happen next. And in order for you to have a high winning percentage, then you have to, you are, you're stating that you believe that you know what's going to happen next and you're going to be able to increase your win ratio. And that, that, that means that when you enter that position today, that you actually believe you know the outcome. But I will suggest that you're wrong. Because the exit, not the entry, determines the outcome. It's not that you buy at 50. It's when you get out will determine the outcome of the position. It may go from 50 to 43 and then to 60 and then down to 2. Okay, And if you don't get out at a profit, then you don't get out at a profit. So the exit determines the outcome, not the entry. That's one key concept. The other thing is, on the probability side... Here, here is the thing that I will that I will tell you that some some more detail about it. So, so number one is that we cannot actually control the probability. Okay, but maybe you can skew it a little bit. And and I almost hesitate to say this because uh, this is all the ammunition they'll need to just keep on doing what they do, and that's fine. I'll I'll keep having my results because I know that this is. The ability to skew the probability is not the edge. The edge is knowing that the exit determines the outcome, not the entry. The edge is knowing how to predefine your risk and and uh, and, and knowing the full equation of expectation. So 08 was a pivotal year, 2008. Pivotal year, pivotal negative performance for the buy and hold strategies out there. But since March of 09... We have seen, from a buy and hold perspective, stocks alone, one fantastic trend. And a log-only trend follower, a buy and hold long-only trend follower with no exit strategy, is is got to be looking at you and other equity trend-following traders and saying, hey, why do I need the exit? Look at all the look at all the money that we've made or that I've made doing this. What's the counter to the person in the middle of the current bull with no exit strategy? Well, good, good point. That well, first, there's several things there. Okay, number one, they thought the same thing in 2000. 
Okay, they thought it back in '94. They thought it, in, you know. They, I mean, there's been many, many times in the past. You know, 19, uh, say '73. I mean, there's, you know, the stock market goes up for, you know, four or five years, and then it goes down. You know, it, cra- it, it goes up for four or five years, and then it crashes down. So it goes up 100 percent, and 50 percent wipes it out, and and that's how it really actually works. It's the asymmetry of math is. Is, is what really happens. So the problem that they have is that you've got a stock market that's been going up for five years and nine months. Hey, it may continue to go to the moon. Okay, we may, and I'll just ride the trend till the end when it bends. But but I want you to understand that the average investor out there, what they need to know with that mindset of buy and hold is what they need to know that these there are cycles. There are periods in which the, the stock market, when you buy it at 27 times earnings, the, the fundamental expected value is dramatically lower going forward than it is if you buy it at 10 times earnings. Because that, that's just a fundamental fact. Now, to your point about about, you know, well, I don't, re- I don't need risk management right now. Well, that's that's normal. As as the trends continue to go up, Mike, what happens is the farther, the longer that trend goes up, the less volatility in the trend that you'll see because people could become complacent. Volatility is range of prices, and the range that range is choppiness up and down. Choppiness is caused by indecision. When people start getting scared and indecisive about what to do next, that's when you start to see that choppiness and that churning of the price, and, the, and that's what and that's what we call volatility. When the price has been going up smoothly, and the longer it's been going up, the smoother the trend gets, the lower volatility goes. And at the very end, right when you need it the most, and I want to use 2007 as the example, and 2007, the stock market being going up from 2003 to 2007, people were very complacent. The trend was going up. Volatility was going down. The asset allocation programs were telling you to put more in stocks because the historical rate of return was higher and the historical volatility was really low. And right as you're putting more into stocks, guess what happened next? You went into 2008, 2009. That is why, my friend, people lost a lot of money. It's a, it's a serious issue right now and, and, and because most people are doing that. Why bother? I mean, if you could take a 50% hit and you know the, the government will bail you out and I mean, when I mean bail out your stock portfolio and, and rise it up 120, 40%, why bother all the trading? Why not just sit there and trust the system? I appreciate those people that are willing to do that because, uh, you know, you, now you got to realize that these these corporations in America do need their money. Okay, so I appreciate the people that do that. I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, I'm not their enemy. I appreciate those that are willing to take that level of risk. I mean, I have nothing against them whatsoever. Thank you for doing that because I need you to be there. Because if we all did what I do, then we'd all pull all our money out of the stock market when it starts to decline, and there would be nothing left. Okay, so I appreciate them doing that, and I have nothing bad to say about them. Now, the second thing is though, is that. The, it's the it's the mathematics of loss in 2007 to 2009 so it was October 2007 to to March of 2009 by the way people talk about 2008 too much it wasn't 2008 it was Mar- it was eight, it was October 2007 to March 2009 was a 56 percent cl- uh, price decline of the S&P 500 it was 60 and 70 percent for other emerging markets countries okay and the, and the commodities index was down like 60 percent it was a massive global sell-off even the bond index dropped 14 percent in the middle of that at some point now after that of course the government stepped in and started doing what they were doing and they they you know they, they did their bailouts and all of a sudden the stock market started going up now it's a very volatile rise and it wasn't easy see it seems easy today because the volatility has been a lot lower lately mike but they forget go look at the volatility levels from 2009 2010 2011 don't forget there's a lot of 10 and 20 percent declines in there that a lot of people can't handle but they were scared of that next loss now the thing is now here we are in 2015, early 2015, it's been going up. It's one of the longest bull market cycles in history, five years, nine mm-hmm. months now. And so, you know, people become complacent and they think that's going to continue. So that they, you know, there, there's the thing. I mean, it's, it, and, and guess what? It only takes, if you make 100%, so if you have a million dollars and it goes from goes up 100%, then now you have $2 million. If it declines 50%, you go from $2 million to back to a million dollars. It's the asymmetry of losses. Losses are, are, you know, losses hurt you more on the downside than they do on the upside. So it doesn't take nearly as much to wipe out your gains as it is. It does, and it takes a long time to to make the gains. So it only took, you know, a year and a half to wipe out a hundred percent gain 
uh, from say so the gains that were made from 2003 to 2007 in the stock index it only took two thousand you know a year less than a year and a half to wipe all those gains completely out and then it then it's got, gained over 100 percent since then been very volatile though it's been a very volatile ride uh, let's not not forget the volatility the fact that it, the range was very very dramatic you know those first two or three years uh, so to think that you would have just bought the stock market back then, you know, I appreciate the people that can do that, you know, that can handle that volatility. I really do. But, uh, but most people can't. And so now, I mean, if we go into another period where it declines, you know, 40 or 50 percent, they're going to lose those gains. So it's not the buy and hold thing. While I appreciate them doing what they do, because I, we, we need them to do what they do, it's just not for me. I personally am not willing to experience 30 and 40 and 50 percent, 60 percent declines in my portfolio, nor are the investors that are in my programs. And so we apply my systems to a very global opportunity set. It includes other country stocks. And, I mean, it's a very global opportunity set. It's stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies using mainly exchange-traded funds. And so I can go buy Singapore, I could buy Thailand. I mean, there's all kinds of different markets out there. I can go long-term treasuries. I can, you know, short the S&P by, by buying, uh, you know, a short ETF uh, that, that shorts the S&P. And so I want this very global opportunity set to try to find trends. And, and the key thing is I don't want to take, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow myself to lose too much in any one of them. And I'm going to manage the, the risk level in the portfolio as a complete portfolio. So at every position that I have, if I have 10 or 15 positions on at a time across this global diversified opportunity set, you know, I know how much risk I have in each and every one of those positions. And I know how much that is at the portfolio level. I think you have given everybody a fantastic, Overview, education, thinking on risk. The best place for everybody to find you, I believe, is Shell Capital, which is shell-capital.com. Do you want to send them to the other website as well? Yeah, I think actually the best website, we just launched a new one, uh, especially for investment advisors, and that is Asymmetry Managed Accounts. Asymmetry is A-S-Y-M-M-E-T-R-Y, managedaccounts.com. That is the best one. Okay. Well, Michael, listen, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You're very comprehensive. I think people can, they're going to have to listen twice to the rapid fire insights that you're giving. You are covering quite a bit of material. And like I said, I think people will really appreciate it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.